Well, hello plant lovers. It is Matthew in Melbourne welcoming you to my channel. Thank you very much for finding me. And if you're new here, I grow cold, cool, intermediate orchids here in Melbourne, Australia. So if that sounds like your thing, do hit subscribe. I post every week. And these are my very amateur ramblings about trying to grow orchids here in my climate, which is the subject of today's video. Plant Today, plant lovers, I thought I'm going to make the video that I wish I could have found two years ago. Well, in fact, three years ago when I began growing orchids, which is basic orchid care for basic orchids in the home. So it's really a beginner's 101 because when I started to grow orchids, I just found it really hard to find information about how to grow them in my climate. There were great channels all over the world, but none of them were really specific to what I'm doing. And what I'm doing is growing orchids either in the house or outside, but without grow lights or humidifiers, without any equipment, just really treating them as houseplants. So cobbling together bits of information from here, there and everywhere, I've sort of stumbled my way to figure out how some things work. And I thought, you know what? I am going to make the basic video that I kind of wish I could have found two and a half years ago. So here it is. Basic orchid growing for beginners. And if you're not a beginner, many apologies. You can fast forward to the next video. <laughs> Now, I do have lots of videos that I've made over the last two years about specific things, so do have a look at those if it's of any interest. I've also made specific videos about uh, fertilizing and potting, which I will link below, which are kind of in the vein of this video as well. But like all good high school debaters, let's define our terms. What is a basic orchid? So I thought, let's just focus on the three most common orchids that you're likely to find in your environment. However, we'll get to that environment in a minute. So firstly, we have cymbidiums, and I'll drop some footage in now because I'm filming this in autumn and it is not the flowering season for cymbidiums here in Australia. The second most common type of orchid found is the oncidium and oncidium type. So all of these beautiful pendulous orchids that are often called dancing lady orchids. But perhaps the most common is the phalaenopsis, which is an orchid that is found literally everywhere in every garage and hardware store and florist in the world, I think. And in fact, the genesis of this video was that we had a dinner party and someone gave me this one as a gift for hosting them, which is kind of how a lot of people enter the orchid world because they are given a phalaenopsis orchid. So those are the three types we're going to look at, cymbidiums, oncidiums, and phalaenopsis. And we're gonna look at basic care in the home. Also outside as well, if your temperature can take it, but essentially the care instructions are basically the same. So we're gonna look at some of the most important things about growing orchids in the home, which are light, which perhaps is the most important. Next, water, equally as important for different reasons. Fertilizer, equally important, we all need food. Repotting, we all grow. There are times when you just get too big for your boots. And humidity, which, well, let's get to that. So as you might know, and you may have found out, there are many, many, many videos and channels about orchids on YouTube. So the first most important thing is to figure out just what is your environment. And then you may be able to find a channel that sort of matches your environment. And that's what I found a little bit difficult. So the most useful for me was perhaps Rachel in Gardening Duenza in Ireland because her weather Although it's not similar, it doesn't freeze. So she actually has quite similar conditions in that she grows orchids sort of on her windowsill and in a greenhouse in summer. And then there are all the other orchid channels that are really fun and wonderful. Lots based in Florida where everything's tropical and gorgeous and colorful and others based in Britain, which is much more about greenhouse culture. So as you can get a sense, difficult to figure out what exactly can work for you. So the first thing to do is figure out, well, what is your environment? As I mentioned, I live in Melbourne in Australia, South East Australia. Now, we don't have the same zonal systems as the United States, so it's hard to describe perhaps to an American audience quite what our weather and climate is, but we are described as a warm temperate or a wet Mediterranean climate. And what that means is that we have hot, dry summers, which do rain, so not that dry, and we have cool, wet winters, which don't freeze. Well, here in the city centre of Melbourne, they don't. So um, winter and nighttime minimums hover at the lowest at around four to five degrees centigrade. So that's around 40 Fahrenheit. So that's outside. Inside, well, I live in a house and our climate means that a lot of people have heating in the winter and air conditioning in summer. So our house certainly has both. 
but obviously in summer the ambient temperature is much warmer and in winter the winter minimum temperatures are of course lower but they're obviously not as cold as the temperatures outside. But most people in sort of temperate climates, your house is gonna be pretty similar temperature wise in terms of the scale of minimums to maximums, uh, winter to summer. So essentially, we're talking about growing these as houseplants. And if you like your conditions, your orchids will. Let's clear the decks and go one by one. So this beauty is an Oncidium and oncidiums are part of a large group which we won't go into because this is orchid growing for beginners so let's not complicate the issue needless to say you can delve further and further and further and further into orchid history and growing and botany and all manner of things which you probably will if you start to get the orchid bug but let's just say for the minute oncidiums are part of a large group many different names and types which are often found in states like this in full bloom in garden centres, nurseries, and florists sometimes as well. So here in Melbourne, this would be the third most common orchid that you see in those sorts of shops. And all the Oncidiums and all their various distant relatives all come from South and Central America. And I think some come from the Southern USA, but anyway, they're all basically New World orchids. So this type of orchid has pseudobulbs, which are these things here. There you go these large sort of fleshy bits at the bottom. And that is the thing that contains all the energy which gives the plant the will to flower and to live. And perhaps logically, that is where the plant stores all its nutrients and water. Which brings us, I think, to the first most interesting point about orchids, which is they are a lot tougher than you might think. Moral of the story, don't be afraid of orchids because the three basic ones we're talking about are not that finicky. And really, if you can grow indoor plants, you'll be able to grow these three orchids as well. So oncidium type orchids have these pseudobulbs and then they produce new growths, which emerge, which you can see here, which emerge from the base of the pseudobulb. And you might get a flush of those new growths maybe twice a year. It depends on the type of orchid that you've actually got, but essentially they can do that growth spurt almost at any point and they can flower often twice a year. And the relationship between flowering and growth is that these new growths here mature and look like these old pseudobulbs. And it's the older pseudobulbs when they've finished growing that produce the flower spike here, which is the most beautiful part of the orchid. So essentially what you've got to do is ensure that your plant is growing new growths like this on a regular basis because they are the ones that are going to give you flowers because with this type of orchid, these pseudobulbs will only bloom once. So you're not gonna get more flowers from that. You need to keep growing new pseudobulbs. And the way to do that, basic care. So the other thing about oncidiums then is that these are hybrids. So they're grown really for cultivation, which means they are essentially growing all the time and can flower a couple of times a year. And that means that really there is no sort of off time, but we'll get to that in a minute. Okay, the next most popular orchid I think that you are likely to come across or get given is the Cymbidium. Now, as I mentioned, it's not flowering season at the moment, so this one is not in bloom. Now, Cymbidiums are an Asiatic orchid, so they grow all the way across Asia from India, Nepal, all the way down the Himalayas, down through Southeast Asia, into Australia and across New Guinea and into some of the Pacific Islands, so quite a wide range. But the orchids that you generally find in hardware stores and in florists are all hybrids of the Chinese higher altitude orchids, which means, again, they're quite tough and they can take quite cool temperatures. And once again, as with the Oncidiums, you can see that these orchids also have a pseudobulb, which stores all the energy in water, and they produce new growths. And in this case, Cymbidiums produce those once a year, about this time actually, uh, autumn through into winter, and then they flower generally in late winter and early spring. But that can depend where you are. So once again, the name of the game is to make your plant grow as much as it can, because like Oncidiums, the pseudobulb will only flower once, so you need to get more pseudobulbs to get more flowers every year. Okay, so that's that baby. Let's look at the most popular orchid in cultivation, which is Phalaenopsis. There we are, look at that absolutely fabulous and commonly called the moth orchid. Perhaps you can see why. 
Now, you'll see these everywhere in supermarkets, in hardware stores, in florists, I mean, literally everywhere. Gift shops, you'll see plastic ones as well. And they come in a myriad of colours from yellow to pink to stripes to spot and sort of everything in between. White, though, is perhaps the most classic and the most commonly seen, and I still think the most beautiful. Look at that. It is the most gorgeous flower, and look at the size of it. It's absolutely enormous. So you can see why it is so common and so popular as a housewarming gift, instead of giving a bunch of flowers, giving one of these super common to come across. And like our Cymbidium friends, Phalaenopsis come from a similar geographic band. So the Himalayas, Southeast Asia, all the way down the Asian Peninsula, across into the Philippines and New Guinea, and there are a few in Australia and a few in the Pacific Islands. So there you go, similar range. But as you can see, this orchid does not have a pseudobulb, and it basically has one stem, and it grows leaves alternately from the top, bump, 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 from the crown here, which means that this plant will flower many times over the years, as long as you don't kill it, essentially once a year, sometimes twice, if you're lucky. So there we are. There are our three most common orchids in common cultivation. Let's now look at some basic care information. Okay, let's look at what I think perhaps is the most important thing, which is light. Hmm. Now, when I began growing orchids, the phrase bright indirect light is banded around a lot. And I thought, what does that actually mean? And I got it wrong. I put things into strong light and they burnt, and I put things into darker light and they never flower. So that is it in a nutshell. These three orchids need that sweet spot of light, which once you find is super easy, you can leave your plant there and it will just keep blooming and thriving and loving you forever. So in talking about light, one of the things we should talk about is how these orchids grow in the wild, because that might give you an idea of what the sort of light requirements are. Now, all of these, including our Cymbidium friend here, are what is known as epiphytes. And that means that they don't have roots in the soil, that they are growing on other plants, mostly trees. And most epiphytes sort of grow, you've seen pictures of mossy trees in temperate forests and rainforests where you've got ferns and all sorts of things growing on the bark of trees. Well, that is where epiphytic orchids grow, on trees. So you can either get that sort of nook where branches emerge and there's little bits of leaf litter and detritus in there and the orchid will settle in there. Or there can be moss and other plants growing on the branch of trees and the orchid will be growing in that or it can literally cling to the side like an octopus and that is what our phalaenopsis friend does all of those types of plants are called epiphytes so if you imagine that they are on the branch of trees you can imagine that the light that they're getting is not direct because you've got the canopy of the leaves of the tree protecting them so that is an important thing however they are usually up the tree which means there is a lot of light bouncing around. It's just not often that direct. Sometimes, of course, the sun will pass and the leaves will shimmer and light's going to hit the leaves of the orchid. But generally, no direct light, but bright indirect light. So you know what? I will just show you what bright indirect light looks like in my indoor space. And I will show you what bright indirect light looks like in my outdoor space. Okay, plant lovers, let me show you what bright indirect looks like. Now, I'm in the southern hemisphere, so this is a north-facing window. And in the southern hemisphere, north is where all the sunlight is. Obviously, if you're in the northern hemisphere, it will be a south-facing window. So here in the southern hemisphere, a north-facing window is going to give you maximum light all year. So what I've got growing here are various oncidiums because they are all wintering here and they get beautiful indirect light but no direct sunlight onto the leaves and as you can see the leaves are a beautiful green and they all flower for me in this position. Now what you could do if you were lucky enough is to grow your orchids outdoors in summer and if you're able to do that then look at that light that is dappled indirect light so I have got this polycarbonate roof here, which again acts as a sort of a filter and a screen. And then you have this dappled light over the orchids, which kind of replicates what it would be like in a forest. So I have got orchids growing here. If you're able to grow your orchids outdoors in summer or all year, if you're in a temperate part of the world, then that's the type of light for those three orchids that we were just looking at. And if you can grow some bidium orchids outside, if your weather is not freezing in winter, then this is where I grow mine, underneath some deciduous trees so they get filtered light in summer and then when the leaves drop they obviously get more light in winter so as you can see it sort of looks pretty foresty under there 
but I can do that because our winters don't freeze. And this is really the sort of perfect environment for growing cymbidiums. And all mine are here all year, and they all flower beautifully. So you can see they are getting a little bit of direct light, but it moves because of the protection from the branches and the leaves. So it's not burning fierce light on the leaves all day. There you go. So our cymbidium friend here is a forest plant. So it often grows towards the lower end of the canopy, if you like, so closer to the ground. So it gets pretty dappled light. Now, if this orchid gets direct sunlight, it's not going to kill it, but it will start to turn the leaves really sunburned essentially they get quite yellow and brown and they get black spots on them so that's an indication that you've got too much light and if you don't have enough light you won't get flowers so that will also be fairly obvious now our oncidium yeah. friend again bright in direct light which is not dissimilar to our cymbidium friend but perhaps a little brighter so if you've got yours growing in a room it will be closer to a window where the light is filtered because what you don't want is direct light hitting the leaves of these orchids because the leaves will get affected and they'll start to sunburn very quickly so if you're growing them inside you want either curtains protecting the plants from direct light or like mine you've got a sort of an opaque glass which is acting as a bit of a natural layer preventing the direct sun hitting the leaves and our Phalaenopsis friend here, that also likes bright indirect light. And you know what? Although people often say it's a low light orchid, it can really take similar light to your Oncidium, perhaps a little bit on the shadier side. But essentially, if you've got a well lit room, this would be the perfect plant for that. So if you're growing other indoor plants, many of those are going to have the same needs. They're not going to want direct light. They're going to want bright indirect light. Bob's your uncle, you can put them in the same place. The only thing I would say is that our cymbidium friend needs a little bit more light in winter if you're able. So again, if you're growing them indoors all year, you might want to put it closer to the window in winter and that will help your plant flower in spring. Next most important thing which people often ask questions about is watering. Hmm. Now, as I said, orchids are a lot tougher than you think. And two of these orchids have capacity to actually store water. So you don't need to be that hung up about it. I think that's the moral of this story. So let's look at our Oncidium friend here. Now, a good rule of thumb with these three types of orchids is to let them dry a reasonable amount in between each watering. Now, of course, depending on your climate will depend how often that is. And in summer, of course, they'll dry out faster than in winter. So you've got to play it by ear. In winter, water them less, and in summer, water them more. But don't be terrified if you forget. And I also have to say, I go on holiday for a couple of weeks. I give all of these a good water beforehand and then just leave them to their own devices. So watering a fairly average water, which might be in winter, maybe once a week, once every seven to 10 days, and in summer, maybe every three or four days. Again, depends how warm your house is and how warm your summers are. And literally all I am doing is just moistening the potting medium around the edge of the plant. Not a huge amount of water, just a little bit. And it dribbles through. You can see the water's draining there. And what you don't want is to leave the plant sitting in that water because what orchids don't like is soggy roots. If you remember, they're epiphytes, they're in those trees, it's raining, it's windy, the rain passes past them and it will evaporate quite quickly. So they're not usually stuck in a soggy medium. So just make sure that you don't keep your orchids in a wet tray. So a good thing is to let it finish draining and then pop it back in your receptacle and you're good to go. Now that will be what I would do once or twice a week, as I said, depends on the season that you're in. But you might often come across the phrase flushing. So remember, our plants are in the wild epiphytes and the water runs past them all the time. So it's constantly being refreshed, nutrients, air, all the good things in life. But here, our plant is in a pot and it's in a constricted space. So basically, everything stays in the pot. So what you need to do from time to time is literally give it a good rinse, like washing your hair. So this is what flushing looks like, and it's a good idea to maybe do this once a month, particularly in the summer season. So you literally just pour water all the way over the plant, and you see it is all draining out. And what you're doing there is flushing out any, any fertilizer or anything else that may have built up into your potting medium. So give it a good flush and a good drain. Let all of this water drip out and then put your orchid back in its dish. 
Now our phalaenopsis watering in a very similar way. You can see this is growing in something different. This is sphagnum moss, which is very common in terms of when you're given phalaenopsis orchids, they're often growing in this medium, whereas our oncidium is growing in little bits of bark. It doesn't really matter what type of medium it is that you've got, pretty much a similar sort of watering. Just give it a little gentle dribble, there you go. And with phalaenopsis, about the same time, same frequency as you would your oncidium. And once again, I would let it dry reasonably between waterings. However, what you have noticed with this is it doesn't have a pseudobulb. So not one to let dry out completely for a long period of time because you will start to get your leaves looking a little bit wilty and dehydrated, literally like it needs a drink. And once that happens, the leaf unfortunately won't just ping back like other houseplants. It is really permanently damaged until the new leaves grow and they're all fleshy and gorgeous because you're watering it correctly. So if you start to get wrinkly leaves, you know you're not watering it enough. But fear not, you haven't killed it. Just make sure that you up the watering a little bit and your plant will recover over time. And with our Cymbidium friend, pretty similar. Give it a good watering every now and then when you feel that it's dry. Let it dry out reasonably between waterings. Don't let it sit in water. Again, doesn't like to have soggy roots. Remember, it's an epiphyte and the water rushes past it all the time. And less in winter really when it's cold and more in summer when it's evaporating. Now, the next most often asked question is about fertilizing, feeding. And some people never fertilize their orchids and good on them. Ha. But as we said, these plants in their natural habitat are epiphytes. They are living on trees with all of this water and nutrients running past them on a fairly regular basis. So they are constantly getting access to nutrients through the water that is um, passing by them. Now, obviously in a pot, they're not. It's a pretty static environment. So you've got to add fertilizer. And again, you can get really bogged down the rabbit holes with all of this about phosphorus and nitrogen and not using urea and all of these things, which are quite confusing. And I am not a scientist, so I can't tell you any rhyme or reason about the absolute facts about any of that. All I will say is let's keep it really simple. For these three types of orchids, you can use essentially the plant food that you'd use for anything else. And you will often find in hardware stores or garden centers a fertilizer that is directed specifically for orchids, but you'll also find a general fertilizer for flowering or fruiting plants, and that will do just as well. I think the most important thing to remember is mix it up. Don't use the same thing all the time, like us. They get bored with a, a diet that is always the same. And then the other thing I would say is always reduce the amount really down, despite what it might say on the packet or the bottle. So I would go down to even sort of one sixth, one eighth, one tenth of what the recommendation is. Keep it on the leaner side rather than overdoing it. Overfeeding plants doesn't do them any favors. So those fertilizers you can use can be liquid or a pellet. And I've made a video about fertilizers, which I will link. And that goes through all the different ones I use. Ultimately, again, doesn't really matter. Find whatever works for you and what's available in your area and it will work for them. So then frequency. Hmm. Now, a good rule of thumb is fertilize your plants when it's doing something. Now that is often in the warmer months, spring, summer, sometimes into autumn. So back to our insidium friend, you've got your new growth coming here. This plant is really growing. It's growing a whole new pseudobulb really, which is gonna flower, needs as much energy as it can get. So I will be and am gently feeding this and maybe really depends, but you can add a diluted amount of fertilizer, maybe once every three waterings. And what I do in spring with all of my orchids is just put a few grains, literally three or four grains of a slow release general fertilizer onto the top of the medium of the pot, which then releases nutrients over time. So if you do forget during your warmer seasons, it's okay. You kind of got yourself covered. And in fact, you could just do that. So generally, those fertilizing times are in the warmer months. That's when the orchid is actually putting on growth. But with a Phalaenopsis orchid, it can produce new leaves almost at any point. So you might want to keep fertilizing it all year, but reduce the frequency in winter when it's colder. 
And our Cymbidium here, now this is a plant that puts on most of its growth in autumn and winter. So ironically, this is one of the orchids that you would be feeding all year. Again, not to a huge amount, so really reduce the dilution or the volume that you're giving it. But maybe, you know, once every two or three weeks during autumn, while the new shoots are growing, you want to make sure the plant has as much energy as it can so those plants mature so that next spring you're going to get flowers from them. But like all of our other care information in this video, don't get too worried about it. If you find a general fertilizer for flowering plants that works, it will work for orchids. Don't do it in too much volume and don't do it too often. Simple. Now, repotting. Goodness me, another thorny issue perhaps for the beginner. But it doesn't need to be. Now, another thing to remember about all our epiphytic friends, which all of these are, is that they grow in quite confined space. So you can see how small this pot is in relation to the size of the plant. So a good rule of thumb with the three types of orchids we're looking at is keep the pot as small as possible to still fit the root system of your plant. Now you can use any type of pot. I tend to always use terracotta pots because I'm a terracotta pot kind of guy, but I just bought this beautiful Oncidium and it's still in plastic. So you can grow it in anything that's available to you or that the orchid comes in. And really, don't repot the orchid until it is really pushing at the seams and it's obvious that it really needs some new love. Or if the soil, the medium that it's in, is starting to look a bit like it's deteriorating or breaking down or it smells, that's a good time to whip it out and see what's going on. And the time of year to do that, hmm, generally when it's not in flower, it's a good idea. So spring is not a bad time. So with our Oncidium plant here, we have all of these new growths growing now. So that plant is in active growth. It's producing new roots. That's a really great time to repot it. But as you can see, it's autumn right now when I'm making this video. So if this plant wasn't in bloom and it really needed to be repotted, I would repot it now because it's growing. Baleonopsis tend to flower once a year. So again, I wouldn't be repotting it whilst it was in bloom. I'd wait till the flower died. And that then could be at any point in the year. And with our Cymbidium friend, once again, I would be repotting these in spring when the flowers have finished. And just what to pot these in? Hmm, I will link you to my video where I go through all the different things that I use. But when I first started to grow orchids, such as Oncidiums and Cymbidiums, I just used out of the bag orchid mix from a hardware store, which is large bits of bark with some other material in it, so it's quite gritty. And I have to say that when I was beginning with this type of orchid, they all did really well. The Phalaenopsis we can see is growing in sphagnum moss and you can grow orchids in 100% sphagnum moss. And depending where you are in the world, that might be the best thing for you. So this is the thing about understanding what your local climate is to understand what is the best way to pot them up. But anyway, the only thing to remember is it's got to be light. These plants grow in a natural environment where there is lots of movement and airflow around the roots. They're not enclosed in the ground. They're literally out in the atmosphere. So there's lots of wind blowing around them, lots of water running through them, and they're drying out quite quickly. You need to find a material that's quite loose and you'll find out of the bag orchid mix can do that just as well. And if you want to be a bit more specific, you can just buy yourself bags of orchid bark, which you can get from orchid specialist shops online. But I'll link my video and you can watch that if you want to know more about potting orchids. And the last thing that you'll hear mentioned in relation to growing orchids is humidity. Mm. Now, most of these orchids grow from parts of the world where it is quite humid, even if it's cooler humid or warmer humid. Nonetheless, it is humid. So Phalaenopsis grow in that sort of Himalayan area where it is moist and humid pretty much all the time. Our Cymbidium friends grow in quite humid forests in China. And our Oncidium friends grow in quite moist forests in South America. So there you go. You would think, oh, my house is not humid enough because I don't live in a greenhouse. Well, here's the thing. As I said before, orchids are quite tough and resilient. And if you like your conditions, your orchids probably are too. Unless for some reason you live in an incredibly drying house. Perhaps you've got quite a full on heating system or a very drying air conditioning system. But generally the ambient humidity in your house is gonna be fine. And should you feel the need, you can get yourself a little squirty bottle and just squirt your orchids every time you walk past with a cup of tea in the morning. But if you don't do that, they'll be fine as well. And I try and miss mine when I remember, but I don't do it every day. I might do it every two or three days. They all seem fine. 
So don't get hung up about humidity with these three types of orchids that we're looking at today. So there we are, plant lovers, a bit of a race through growing orchids 101. As I said, I think the thing to remember is, firstly, relax. They are much tougher than you think. Secondly, the easiest way to kill an orchid is by too much water. So if in doubt, underwater it. You'll be able to see pretty quickly if the plant's not happy, but underwatering is better than overwatering because that will kill them. No one likes cold, soggy roots. But essentially, if you can grow houseplants, you'll be able to grow these three types of orchids. So plant lovers, good luck with your orchids. I hope that this has helped if you're beginning your orchid journey. And if you're well on your orchid journey, well, thank you for watching anyway. Now I do post every week on a Friday and I will link some of the videos that I mentioned below. Do subscribe, I post every Friday. So I'm looking forward to seeing you as your orchid journey continues. So until then, plant lovers, take care and I'll see you next week.